Okay, I suggest we start uh, the first webinar of a new series uh, organized by the GMDP Academy. Uh, my name is Domenico Criscuolo and I am a member of the board of directors and I volunteer to organize uh, these webinars that uh, will appear every month, usually at the end of the month. Uh, we decided to start this new series talking about oncology. We know that oncology is a big scientific challenge and more than 50% of global clinical trials are in oncology. Just as a demonstration of the scientific interest, but also the challenges that different type of cancer pose to the clinician. So, there are also some news in oncology that we will hear today, and uh, not only new drugs that uh, apparently have a target uh, in some uh, genetic mutation, but also vaccination is uh, little by little demonstrating uh, interesting results. So today we have in that discussing these two areas, two scientists, uh, Dr. Ottfried Kistner from Vienna and uh, Professor Gilberto Filacci from the University of Genova. Uh, let me start introducing you, Dr. Kistner. He is now a senior consultant to many pharmaceutical companies. He has more than 40 years experience in virology and 35 years experience in vaccine development. So he has really over the decades accumulated a significant experience. He has published more than 60 papers and has presented his data in more than 400 conferences on virology, vaccine, and so on. He is also a lecturer in several Austrian universities, and I just learned a few minutes ago that he is also uh, as a, in ongoing collaboration with the uh, Siena Lab for the development of vaccine. So I will close here this uh, brief introduction, and I will ask uh, Dr. Kinsner to make his uh, speech. Thank you, Alfred. Uh, thank you, Domenico, for this nice introduction. And let's go in media series. Uh, okay. That's not working, which is not good. Ah, okay, let's okay, try this, yeah. this way, work better. Okay, so the title of the webinar is a fight against cancer. And what about or differences vaccines or immunotherapeutics? And this is a heritage from my times in industry. So this is a disclaimer that I'm telling you what I know. If you know more than me, good for you. And that I'm not responsible for any conclusions you may made out of my statements. That's all over your own topic. Um, actually, I have changed the presentation a little bit by getting this report from Vaccine Europe saying there is uh, more than 100 vaccine candidates in the pipeline of Vaccine Europe and 92 prophylactic vaccines and eight therapeutic vaccines. And if we have a look, if we have a look at what, what is there, look at the red ones. These are vaccine approaches or therapeutic approaches against cancer, so lung collateral, skin, solid tumors, glioblastoma, but we also have therapeutic vaccines against viruses like herpes simplex and hepatitis B. And therefore, I would like to expand a little bit on immunization to make ourselves aware where we are coming from and what we would like to end up. So the overview is first and in short introduction, immunization and vaccines, all the adjuvants, because I think Shilpa Atto will re, uh, refer to his vaccine, which contains an adjuvant, as far as I know. 
Then vaccines against infectious viruses with cancerogenic potential, like hepatitis B virus, human papilloma virus, and then personalized medicine, vaccines, immunotherapies, and then specifically immunotherapies against cancer. And then I would like to conclude what I've tried to teach you here. So as an introduction, uh, formally, immunization or vaccination was considered to contain everything, which means active and passive immunization. And in the last years or decades even, the emphasis was more on active vaccines, but nowadays we coming more back to passive immunization and therefore I will expand and tell about this. So active is really what we know, vaccination of a healthy human to induce immunity against potential infections or the disease in future. How will we do this? Application of protective antigens of the respective pathogen and the immune system builds actively a protective immune response against the invader. That means production of antibodies and or specific immune cells, including memory cells for later re possible reinfections. And passive what is here, infection has already happened without a chance for the immune system to establish a protective immune response in time. So how do we do this? We apl apply ready to use antibody preparations. It's usually immune globulins or nowadays monoclonal antibodies. And the antibodies will recognize and neutralize infectious agents. But the immune system cannot produce specific antibodies or immune cells. Uh, what we know about passive that has not been invented by humans has invented by nature so we have the natural way of passive immunization with maternal antibodies during pregnancy and breastfeeding but we also have the human way the artificial i would call it horse and human sera for example against tetanus snake venoms and as we have mentioned more and more monoclonals to fight these pathogens and the classical definition of vaccination was induction of a protective immune response against specific pathogens to prevent respective infection and subsequent disease. The vaccination mimics the infection by providing the antigens of the specific pathogens to induce antibodies, which are usually induced by infection as well, and so make protection. The duration of these and specific antibody lasts usually 10 to 14 weeks, but these antibodies may persist and be functional for years or even decades. And on top of all, the host generates memory cells, T and B cells, and for example, the B memory cells can start production of antibodies rapidly within four to seven days after new infection of the respective pathogen. Sometimes it's within three days, which is a really fast response. And as a host generates the antibody by itself, it's called the active immunization. But nowadays, if you talk about immunizations, and I mentioned we have prophylactic, therapeutic, immunotherapeutic. What does it mean? We have, as usual, as we know for long, prophylactic immunization against infectious agents. That's protection against the infection. Example is influenza, polio, pneumococcal, meningococcal, malaria. But we already have prophylactic immunization against cancer. This vaccination against infectious agents, which have cancerogenic potential and the well-known hepatitis B and HPV. Then what we also have therapeutic immunization against infectious agents. So it's reduction or elimination of persistent viral infections and or lesions. Examples are again, HPV, hepatitis C, HIV, HPV, and SARS-CoV-2 virus, especially against uh, long COVID. But on top, we also have therapeutic immunization against cancer. This may result in suppression of existing tumors, but this is often in combination with other therapies. And examples are prostate cancer, renal cancer, colon carcinoma, melanoma. And last but not least, we have the monoclonal antibody therapies nowadays, use of monoclonal antibodies against infectious agents or carcinomes. Examples are respiratory syncytial virus, COVID-19, melanoma, and the long, non-small cell lung carcinoma. Uh, that brings us back to the classical vaccines. We have live attenuated infectious agents, 
bacteria like BCG, tuberculosis, or viruses, polio, yellow fever. But we, on the other side, we have inactivated vaccines, killed pathogens. So we have whole virus, whole virus vaccines inactivated with an intact structure, split vaccines, part of disrupted pathogens, or subunit vaccines, selected purified antigens of a pathogen. And this may be toxoid vaccine, like tetanus diphtheria, polysaccharide vaccines, like specific bacteria, or conjugate vaccine, where we combine the polysaccharides with a covalently bound carrier protein, which may be tetanus toxid, one of the best examples, minococco or pneumococci again. Or we have single proteins like hepatitis B, so like some influenza vaccines, and we also have peptide vaccines, but here we have to mention there's no approved vaccine yet but we expect they may come one day in addition. This is just an example, big fermentation facility, 6,000 liter scale to produce classical virus vaccines like whole virus, split virus, subunit, or live attenuated vaccine. Then, then, of course, the vaccine is inactivated and purified by Sarkov's great in purification and then filled into syringes. But nowadays, and I've tried to separate it from subunit vaccine. What we have is also recombinant vaccine. What is a recombinant vaccine? It starts with a recombinant DNA, RDNA. It's an artificial DNA molecule in vitro generated by gene technology techniques. And this recombinant DNA is used to produce a recombinant protein. And the recombinant vaccines include subunit vaccines like the hepatitis B vaccine. And here it's interesting. This is the first recombinant, recombinant vaccine already licensed in 1986. And the production systems are bacteria, yeast, insect cells, buccalo plant, tabac, mammalian cell lines. We can use the subunit to produce virus like particles or nanoparticles, for example, like HPV vaccines, and we can also use it for as vectors, attenuated viruses or bacteria, for example, Ebola. And last but not least, what we have is a nucleobased vaccines based on DNA or RNA molecules, again, in vitro generated. This is just an example for the Bacolo expression system. And here we already have a licensed vaccine, a quadrivalent flu vaccine, flu block or Supentep, as it's called in Europe. Here is an example for the HPV. It's a major CAPSI protein, and these virus particles are very immunogenic, but they are non-infectious and non-oncogenetic. And as an example, because I think uh, we will hear more about nanoparticles, I've presented here the nanoparticle technology of uh, Novovax with recombinant nanoparticles, for example, flu or sars corona and an etuvant which also has a uh, particulate structure, which is very attractive for the immune system. And... Now we come to the latest generation gene-based vaccine. We here either have vector vaccines, which is attenuated bacteria viruses working as a vehicle, carrying foreign recombinant antigens of the different pathogen. The immune response will be directed against this antigen. And we have two types of vectors, a replicating vector, so the vector can grow in the vaccinees, or non-replicating vector, the vector cannot grow in the vaccinees. So these are the famous uh, chimp adenovirus, which will not grow, or the classic adenovirus vector, they can grow. And last but not least, we have the nucleobased, nucleotide-based vaccines, DNA and RNA. And here, we do not need fermenters anymore because the cells of the vaccine will produce the antigens themselves. And how is this working? We inject in vitro generated nucleic acid, of a specific protein of the target pathogen. This will be expressed and translated into proteins and then presented to the immune system. And the example is here, just in a slide. So the DNA is transcribed into RNA, which we call transcription. This happens in the nucleus and the RNA is transported in the cytoplasma and translated into proteins with the help of ribosomes, which we call translation. And we have two types, the DNA vaccines, they have to go in the nucleus 
They have to produce the RNA and then go into cytoplasma to the ribosome. And we have the RNA vaccine and I call it also the sh always a shortcut. So there's no entry of the nucleus necessary. The mRNA can directly bind to the ribosome and produce the specific proteins. So it's a more faster and more specific process than DNA vaccine. And as I've said, although in this case, now adjuvants came back they have a new future. But what are adjuvants? Adjuvants are end gradients of many vaccines for the following reason. To allow a longer persistence in the body, which we call the depot effect. To increase an immune response, or in a worst case scenario, to induce an immune response at all. And now we come to the point, it's also used to modulate the immune response. For example, towards an increased antibody or Th2 response, that's good for infectious viruses, but also the cellular mediated immune response, CMI or Th1 response. This is important for chronic virus diseases or for cancer. So we see the role of adjuvant is becoming bigger and bigger because uh, in former times, for more than 70 years, only aluminum hydroxide was using for example, for inactivated polio, IPV, HIV, pneumococcal vaccines, and so on. Nowadays, we have ASO1, AFO3, ASO3, it's liposomes, it's oil and water emulsions, and they can be used for malaria vaccine, RSV, pandemic influenza. We also have an ASO4 for hepatitis B vaccine, for HPV vaccines. We have oligodeoxynucleotides like CPG, 2018 for hepatitis B or COVID-19 vaccines. And we have the Matrix M used for COVID-19 vaccines, but also for the Malaya vaccine R21. And we have the MF59, the oil and water emulsion used for seasonal influenza vaccines. So quite a bunch of new adjuvants and there's more to come. And uh, this is, was not part of my presentation because otherwise it would be too much slides. So now we come to the main point. Uh, viruses with cancerogenic potential, what we can do here, hepatitis B, hepatitis uh, human papilloma virus, HPV. We just can use the classical active immunization, as we have seen before. And this is just uh, hepatitis B from the WHO website saying that it's working against the hepatolocellar uh, carcinoma. So uh, this vaccine licensed first time in 86 was actually the first cancer vaccine. And many years ago, nearly close to 40 years ago, which no one sometimes can believe how early in early times, how good vaccine were produced. And for the HPV vaccines, we have six licensed HPV vaccines. We have two valent types, two valent against the type 16 and 18. We have the four valent against type 6, 11, 16, and 18. And we also have a nine valent against type 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, 58. And we have more than 100 types. So this will increase more and more dependent on the severity of these different types of human papilloma viruses. Having said this, this could be a classical mass vaccination against human papilloma virus, but now becoming more in the field of personalized medicine, of personalized vaccines and personalized immunotherapies. And there we have what I've mentioned, some points to consider. And actually, there's a lot of research background and a lot of new terms, as we can see here, because all of this new vaccine developments and immunotherapies are really based on what we call the isms, the genetics, the omics. And I just read it, gene profiling, gene association studies, gene polymorphism, medicine, immunogenetics, immunogenomics, protein, proteomics, transcriptomics, vaccinomics, and it even goes to system biology, which may allow, for example, vaccination against vectors like uh, ticks or like mosquito, rather than against the disease, which is or the infectious agent, which is transmitted by them. And 
Now I would like to come to the most important point. A lot of slides already, but now we're talking about immune therapies against cancer. We will hear very nice data from uh, Gilberto Filacci, from Professor Filacci, but I just raise it here. So again, we have different immunization strategies. One is molecular-based vaccine, where we can use peptide or protein vaccines, where we can use DNA vaccine, or where we can use mRNA vaccine. On the other hand, second approach, again, vector-based vaccine. We use naturally or genetically engineered viruses or vectors to express antigen, like bacterial vectors, virus vectors, or yeast-based vaccine. And finally, we come to personalized medicine, the cell-based vaccines, where we use dendritic cells or genetically modified cells of our patient to express or deliver antigens. And there may be dendritic cell vaccines or the modified cell vaccines. And the next slide will just show one of the types is just have oncolytic virus ther therapies. So what we have, we have a virus, an oncolytic virus with immune stimulating genes. And this can be used to fight cancer. And already 2015, the first immunotherapy using an oncolytic virus was used by the FDA. Or what we have, the very, very specific uh, individual activity is a so-called CAR T-cell, the chimeric antigen receptor. So we engineer the patient's immune cells to treat their cancers. That means we have to take them out of the body, uh, modify them genetically, in the lab and then put them back and they will allow to fight against cancer. And there are a lot of different approaches, which I cannot mention all here. It's just to give you an overview how many different types of immunotherapies or ways to fight cancer are on the way. And to show you here that it is not an easy task, even for the licensed authorities, I have here an example, a licensed monoclonal antibody to treat cancer. It's an active substance, uh, Duava Lumab. And this is a me medicine used to treat lung cancer in adults with. And I've just now some references uh, from the EMA license document. And you can use it against non-small cell lung cancer that is locally advanced, which cannot be removed by surgery and used by its own and only when the cancer produces a protein known as PTL1. So this means you have to really screen the patient carefully. What is the situation of this type of cancer in this specific subject or patient? Or a second approach is that it can also fight against the NSCLC that has metatized out of the lung. And then it's given together with another antibody and a platinum-based chemotherapy. And this can be used when the cancer has no mutations. So if the cancer has mutations, and then we have another three or four applications where we can use it. So it's just an example how specific you must show your, how your patient is reacting. And this brings us to the last point and to the most critical point people are discussing, the so-called LCs, the ethical, the legal, and the social issues. And examples are database issues, confidentiality, patent rights, compatibility between different databases, data sharing, conflict of interest, informed consent, and right of withdrawal, and also what may happen, discrimination or stigmatization. So there's a lot beyond the vaccine development or the immunotherapy development against viruses and against cancer. And therefore, I would like to conclude now this presentation by just uh, putting together what I've mentioned. So the progress in the field of omics and genetics have fundamentally broadened our knowledge on the genetical and immunological background of infections and vaccinations, but also on generalized and individual cancer therapies. And new and complex targets such as RSV, Lyme, multi-resistant bacteria, malaria, or cancer have already resulted in a broad portfolio of immunization and vaccination strategies. So we have, as we have mentioned, the active immunization or vaccinations prophylactically, therapeutically against infectious pathogen and cancer. 
We have the passive immunization, respectively the immune therapies, again, prophylactically, therapeutically against infectious pathogens and cancers. But what they also have is combination therapies with active and passive immunization. And sometimes I call it the combination of a safety belt and the airbag. So the active immunization is a safety belt the passive is the airbag in case more happens. And uh, this part portfolio is a result of the introduction of novel state-of-the-art technology platforms combined with modern event system. And one must admit the development and optimization of a couple of these platforms have been triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic and their fight against it. So here I would like to end and thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Otfried. Uh, very nice overview. You have uh, given us uh, a lot of information, so I'm sure that somebody will ask uh, some clarification and some questions. But as agreed, we will have the question and answer session at the end of the second uh, presentation. So now let me introduce myself, uh, Professor Gilberto Filacci. Uh, Gilberto is a physician, he studied medicine at the University of Palermo, then he moved to the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, where he spent several years in the lab of Abraham, and he was uh, uh, introduced to the important area of immunology and immunotherapy. Then, after about 10 years, he moved back to Italy and uh, had a, a full professor position at the University of Genova and is now full professor of immunology in that university. Let me say that uh, he also was the scientific uh, director of Genovax, a biotech that uh, we founded uh, exactly 15 years ago aiming at the development of uh, vaccine, therapeutic vaccine. Uh, we were quite successful to attract uh, some uh, investors who gave up uh, the initial blood to go on uh, in the development of a, a product that I'm sure Gilberto will show briefly. And we were able to conclude a successful phase one and also a very large European phase two trial with interesting results. Then, unfortunately, COVID created a condition that the investor were a little bit worried to continue the development in a period of a great uncertainty. So we had to stop the development at the end of a good phase two, and we are left with the idea that we have no uh, nothing to blame and uh, uh, we are a little bit uh, dissatisfied because we were hoping to help patients uh, in their diseases. In any case, uh, I don't want to spend more words on this uh, and I will uh, give the microphone to Gilberto for, a, uh, for his presentation. Thank you, Gilberto. Thank you, Domenico. Thanks for uh, your nice presentation. I decided to thank also Otfried for the wonderful introduction on, on the field of vaccination and cancer vaccination in particular. So I will uh, tell you about the uh, effort that we made in the last 20 years uh, in the search for uh, a universal cancer vaccine. So uh, an important event in the history of tumor immunology was the discovery of the first uh, tumor can you, can you try, sorry to interrupt you, can you uh, put in a full screen mode so we can read better? Uh, I, I I was thinking it was just, uh, it was already in full screen but uh, uh, let me see how can I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's already better. It's not full screen, but it's better. It's better, you, but you uh, can continue. Go on. Okay, but you may may try to use a button on the screen, on the yeah, on the I, button, right? 
the, okay the now it's uh, definitely better thank you here yes 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 that that one you have tried okay no back no. it's not working sorry it doesn't work okay sorry so it's no. better like this yes you can continue in this mode yes okay i can do like this okay, okay. Okay, so uh, this was an important event, the discovery of the first tumor associated antigen, because uh, it uh, uh, made clear that uh, uh, the immune system can recognize tumors uh, if they are able to see on the, on the cancer cell uh, specific uh, antigens, and uh, eventually they can mount uh, an immune response able to kill tumors. So since then, Several uh, tumor associated antigens uh, have been discovered belonging to different uh, classes. And the feature of these uh, tumor associated antigens is that they are specific for uh, a, um, a particular type of disease. For instance, uh, PSA is specific for prostate cancer and, and, and so on. There are, on the tumor cells, there are also other uh, antigens uh, that have been uh, discovered more recently that are called neoantigens. These are antigens that come up uh, in consequence of the mutation, that uh, the genomic mutation that occur within, uh, uh, inside the cancer cells. So these are uh, very... Uh, um, are uh, antigens that are specific for the single neoplasias, for the single patient. So they are restricted to just uh, one single tumor. In any case, uh, based on the fact that uh, there are antigens on, on tumor cells, we can imagine to create, to generate a cancer vaccine. Uh, what is a cancer vaccine? A, a, a product that is able to um, stimulate an immune response against an antigen present on tumor cells in order to uh, kill the tumor cells, uh, in order that these stimulated T cells can kill the tumor cells. Currently, we uh, have uh, two types of uh, uh, cancer vaccine. Uh, more traditional cancer vaccines that are specific for tumor-associated antigens and uh, uh, more recent cancer vaccines that are specific for the neoantigens. None of these uh, cancer vaccines is uh, universal and the reason is what we already said that uh, tumor-associated antigens uh, are specific for a, a type of disease but not for all the cancers and even more new antigens are specific just for the disease of a single patient. So no way for a universal cancer vaccine. But is this true? Is there any room for uh, imagine a possibility to generate a universal cancer vaccine? And this was uh, the uh, topic of our search, research in the last 20 years. The first attempt, uh, the first approach that we made was to consider telomerase. Telomerase is, the, is a, a DNA um, transcriptase uh, um, which uh, uh, synthesize the um, telomeres of the cells. This enzyme is expressed during the fetal life, but not in other cells, except sometimes on stem cells. This uh, molecule is important because all the tumors, independently from their histological types, need to reactivate the expression of telomerase in order to can survive, because otherwise, uh, during their continuous uh, uh, proliferation, uh, they will uh, shorten the telomeres, and uh, uh, this will lead to uh, uh, the death of the cancer cell. So all the tumor express telomerase, and uh, telomerase is also important uh, because uh, uh, it was demonstrated that uh, um, 
Uh, the immune system of cancer patients may react against telomerase. So these two concepts um, made uh, um, come up the idea that uh, telomerase can be a universal tumor associate antigens. However, in order to be considered for a vaccine, an antigen must demonstrate its immunogenicity. And in the case of a cancer vaccine, so a cancer antigens, there are two main requirements. The antigen must be expressed by cancer cells and uh, um, uh, the, the repertoire of T cells in cancer patients of the majority of cancer patients must have cells able to recognize this antigen. The first requirement concerning telomerase was demonstrated by the group of Maurizio Zanetti, who showed that um, uh, all cancer cells are able to process uh, telomerase and to present its epitopes on uh, uh, restricted by HLA molecules. Uh, we um, took care about the second requirements and uh, we uh, worked in a serious uh, and wide series of cancer patients affected by different diseases. And we observed in this uh, series of cancer patients that more than 9% of these patients uh, and the, uh, the immune uh, reaction specific for just one epitope of telomerase. Um, so demonstrating that the, the presence of immune response against telomerase is quite diffuse uh, in the population of cancer patients. But what was very important was the fact that the cells able to react against telomerase were also able to kill the uh, tumor cells from the same patients from where these cells were extracted, were purified. Uh, after that, uh, on the basis of all these results, several uh, cancer vaccines uh, based on telomerase as immunogen were generated. And uh, um, this, uh, is, these are the data of the very first uh, of this uh, cancer vaccine that was uh, from the von der Heide group. And uh, they demonstrate that uh, vaccinating against telomerase, it's possible to have an immune response specific for the antigen. And um, patients uh, who generate this immune response uh, get also a clinical response in, term, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of uh, stable disease. So we reason on the possibility to increase the rate of immune response in order to increase also the rate of clinical response because the final goal of the cancer vaccine is the clinical response. And uh, we reason that these three topics uh, were very important. So to widen the HLA haplotype coverage, and to activate both CD4, CD8, and innate immune cells. And we um, uh, thought that uh, a solution to these requirements could be the use of multiple and promiscuous peptides together with uh, a, a complementary adjuvants. So that we generate with this uh, uh, telomerase-based cancer vaccine, we named uh, GX301, uh, which was based on these four telomerase peptides uh, that were chosen because they are promiscuous, so they are able to bind to different HLA uh, molecules uh, belonging to uh, the class one, the class two, and the class one of uh, HLA alleles. We also use uh, a combination of uh, complementary adjuvants, Montanide and Imiquimod, and we performed this phase one trial in patients with very advanced disease affected by prostate and renal cancer. We immunized this patient intradermally uh, eight times, so eight administration of each peptide. We did not see severe side effect, but what we observed was that all the patients were able to uh, have a, a immune response specific against the telomerase. However, some of these patients got better results than the other one, 
And uh, uh, from the clinical point of view, the patients uh, who had a better uh, rate of immune response also demonstrated a better clinical outcome in terms of progression-free survival and overall survival. Uh, we also uh, analyzed the importance of the schedule of administration because uh, at, at a certain point, uh, doubts were uh, generated on uh, the um, uh, utility of make several immunization in a single patient because several immunization can induce also a phenomenon of T cell exhaustion. So it's good or it's not good uh, to immunize several times uh, the patients. So we uh, face this problem in a wide uh, clinical trial, international clinical trial in which three different schedules of GX301 administration were analyzed one with eight administration, one with four, and one uh, regimen with just two administration. Uh, the patient population was constituted by uh, prostate cancer patients, uh, metastatic, and already treated uh, by, um, by docetaxel. And what we observed, again, was uh, a very nice rate of immune response, and uh, the fact that uh, the rate of immune response was uh, uh, parallel to the uh, number of immunization. So it's not true that uh, uh, more immunization is uh, deleterious, but uh, the, better, the, the best results uh, in terms of immunization can, uh, can be achieved by immunizing um, several times the patients. However, as you can see, uh, we never succeed in achieving robust immune response in 100% of patients. However, the clinical out outcome was quite uh, uh, encouraging because we observed a, an overall survival of 50% of patients at two years that was exactly overlapping that of the standard of care. Uh, so the conclusion of this uh, uh, first approach uh, were that telomerase vaccines are immunogenic, immune response uh, uh, are associated with uh, a clinical response. The strategy of using multiple peptide immunization is a good strategy. However, also with all these uh, tricks, we uh, did not get get uh, a, a, a rate of clinical response that was uh, really satisfactory. So the, the, the point is how to, to uh, increase the, uh, the rate of clinical uh, response by cancer vaccination. In, importantly, this was not just a problem with telomerase cancer vaccine. This is the case of melanoma cancer vaccine. You can see several trials, several strategies, and in terms of uh, racist uh, uh, response, so clinical response, very poor results. And although, although if you consider altogether the, the, the patients, you can see that uh, the overall survival in patients treated with cancer vaccination or with uh, immune response, positive immune response to cancer vaccination, is better than uh, uh, that of patients that uh, did not respond to the cancer vaccination. So cancer vaccine made something, but from a clinical point of view, it's not enough. Why this? We imagine that the reason uh, is that the immune system is uh, as an homeostasis. It is a system at equilibrium between inflammation and tolerance. And tolerance is important because uh, a tumor is very able in activating tolerance mechanism in terms of secretion of uh, immunosuppressive cytokines, generation and expansion of regulatory lymphocytes, uh, expression of immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, and, and so on. So the tumor is able to induce exhaustion or energy in all the, immune in all the newly generated immune response 
mainly those uh, uh, that target tumor itself. And this because uh, all these uh, strategies that have been so far uh, used in order to generate cancer vaccine, independently from the technique used for the cancer vaccine, uh, I mean, uh, Otfried cited uh, peptides, uh, um, um, DNA vaccine, uh, and so on. All these uh, traditional cancer vaccine are tumor-centered in terms that we uh, uh, follow the tumors and try to identify the antigens that the tumor express and to generate a new response against these, uh, these antigens. But this uh, give to the tumors a great advantage that it can, it can uh, modulate uh, through the, its uh, tumor immune escape mechanism, it can modulate, modulate this immune response that we try to uh, generate. So we thought, why don't we overturn, completely overturn our approach, our strategy? Instead of starting from the tumor, why don't we start from the immune response? In the organism, in the body, we have some immune responses that are very robust and very consolidated in the years and very consistent, such as the immune response that we get um, with the um, vaccination that we have in the, during the childhood. I mean, against the tetanus, against hepatitis B, against diphtheria and so on. We never see in the clinics a cancer patient who died who dies for tetanus or for diphtheria, just because the immune response that it was generated when the patient was a child is still there and is very, very effective, very robust. While we see cancer patients who dies for who die for pneumonia because they are not able to mount newly generated immune response, very effective newly generated immune response. So we uh, decided to focus on previously existing a robust immune response and to redirect this immune response on uh, tumors. In order to do this, we have to make the tumor expressing the antigen that is the target of this immune response. And is this possible? Is this possible because we can use a strategy, a Trojan horse strategy. So we can get a vector, to, we can put inside the vector, the Trojan horse, the antigen, and we direct this vector inside the tumor cells. So the strategy works uh, by uh, our strategy, we are studying on that right now, is to uh, uh, load um, um, nanoparticles, fib actually six fibroid nanoparticles uh, with uh, uh, an antigen, an antigen that der uh, derives from uh, a previous, previous uh, vaccination, to inject these nanoparticles loaded with the antigens, but also with the, an adjuvant uh, within the tumor, and this uh, activate uh, or, or better redirect the immune response already present in the organism against the antigen, redirect this immune response against the tumor. It's uh, exactly uh, as to redirect uh, uh, the an immune response uh, uh, an arm, a weapon from a conventional target to a desired target such as the tumor. These are the uh, our Trojan horse, uh, the nanoparticles. Uh, silk fibroin is uh, exactly the 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 the, the protein uh, that uh, of our uh, silk dresses. So very, very common, but uh, they can be used in the form of nanoparticles. Uh, you can see them at uh, the electronic microscopy. 
Uh, because uh, we can use them because they have a high biocompatibility, bio uh, a controllable biodegradability, low toxicity, can be fun functionalized, and importantly, uh, they can be uh, uptaken by cancer cells. Cancer cells heavily uh, uptake these cells, and we could demonstrate this in a series of cancer cell lines uh, from uh, um, mouse or from uh, human origin. You can see here inside these cancer cells the nanoparticles. But what is important is that not only uh, if you inject these uh, nanoparticles within cancer cells, uh, you see uh, them within the, the cells, but also within the cancer cells, but also within the dendritic cells that are present in the tumor. So you have a system in which you put the antigen, you are able to put the antigen within your target, that is the cancer cells, and the cells that is the, the uh, main cells which stimulate the onset of an immune response, so the dendritic cells. We could demonstrate the uh, uh, efficacy of this uh, uh, approach in, in vivo. We uh, get some mice, we immunize this mice with an antigen that is not correlated with the uh, tumor of albumin, for instance. Then these mice were challenged with the tumor, a tumor was uh, uh, injected on their skin. And then when the tumor was well developed, it was treated by the nanoparticles, as I said. And you can see that if you get the tumor of untreated mice, you don't see any um, um, over specific T cells. But if you get the, the tumor from uh, mice treated with the nanoparticles, you see a strong infiltration of both CD4 and CD8 of a specific CD4 and CD8 in the tumor. And if you purify these cells, you if, if you check if they are able to kill the cancer cells, they are able to kill cancer cells only if these cancer cells have been pre-incubated with the nanoparticles uh, loading, loaded with the antigens, not just cancer cells. And this because the antigen has been transferred within the cancer cells by the nanoparticles. And this has been tested in two different uh, aggressive uh, um, tumors, uh, B6 melanoma model and MB49 bladder cancer model, just demonstrated that in this way you can treat any kind of tumor because uh, it's not more the tumor that control the immune response uh, expressing its own antigen but uh, we are controlling the redirection of the immune response uh, forcing the entrance uh, of the antigen within the tumor and these are uh, the results uh, uh, the, the protective results, these are the trend of tumor growth in untreated animals or animals treated with nanoparticles without the antigens, so unloaded nanoparticles. These are very aggressive disease. They kill the mouse in a, a few weeks. And instead, you see a stabilization disease, and in many mice, we observed a completely regression of the, uh, of the disease. This, this is the case of melanoma, and this is the case of bladder cancer. So again, you can treat any kind of, of tumor. And what is even more important is that this kind of approach is not just, just an immunological approach, but uh, making a proteomic studies, we observed that uh, the treatment of the tumor cause a, a deep derange, a derange of this uh, reshaping of the, of the tumor uh, concerning several uh, molecules and several functions. So that uh, leading to a reduction of metastatic capacity, uh, reduction of cancer growth, invasivity, reduction of uh, also cancer progression, a complete change of cancer metabolism, completely block of angiogenesis and so, and so on. So it's uh, uh, as uh, a domino effect. 
you uh, induce in uh, um, uh, you change the tumor microenvironment by an immunological tool and then you obtain a cascade of effect concerning metabolism, concerning uh, proliferation, concerning metastatic capacity, and so on. So at this time of our experimentation, we can say that uh, uh, we cited at the beginning of, of this uh, talk that uh, there are two types of vaccine, of cancer vaccine, one um, um, against the tumor specific, uh, tumor associated antigen, and the other one against the neo antigen. Um, we now are working on generation on the generation of this innovative strategy that is based on redirection of pre-existing immunity, which is a personalized approach because you can choose the antigen in, uh, on the basis of uh, the immune response that uh, the patient already has. Uh, so if you see that the patients have strong anti-tetanus uh, immune response, you can choose that antigen. If you see that the, uh, the patient has a strong anti-HBSAG, uh, uh, you can choose that one and so on. But you have the big advantage that you are already on the shelf your uh, vaccine and uh, you do not need all the very uh, sophisticated uh, uh, operation and uh, process, uh, pro processes that you need for generation of uh, neo antigens. So we believe that this approach can be again, a very innovative and can be an approach that uh, could uh, lead to the generation of a, a new category, a, a, a new generation of uh, universal cancer vaccine. Uh, this is just to thank uh, all the people who work uh, with me and with our group in this effort, this 20, 20 years effort. And you see here Domenico Criscuola, and I like to cite this again because uh, he was uh, of, mm -hmm. of uh, great support to several of our study. And uh, of course, uh, all the sponsors uh, who made possible uh, to do this re research. And uh, I decided to thank uh, all of you for the kind attention. Thank you very much, Gilberto. Very interesting. Uh, and uh, let's hope that uh, you will have a successful outcome. Uh, now we have a few minutes left for some questions. Uh, I have uh, one question for Gilberto, one for Ottfried. The first question for Gilberto was, uh, do you consider this uh, nanoparticle as a vector? That was a question. What do you, is your opinion? Yeah, they are a, they are a vector because uh, uh, cancer vaccine, uh, cancer cells, uh, avidly uptake them, while uh, normal cells uh, do not have the same behavior. So it's a, a very good good vector. Also, they are not toxic. And uh, we decide to uh, administer them directly at the tumor sites in order to limit the eventual toxicity. Because uh, you know, when you um, uh, inject an antigen, uh, in, uh, this can be uptaken by uh, any cells. So if uh, if it, it is uh, within a normal cells you can uh, have the induction of uh, an inflammatory uh, reaction in uh, a, an organ or in a tissue that you don't decide to be target. So we really believe there are, uh, and there are several experimental uh, demonstrations that they are a very good vector. Thank you, Gilberto. That's a, a question for Alfred. Um, Considering uh, the various opportunities that we have in oncology, what is uh, your view to when is the right moment to stimulate the immune system? Uh, in the early stage of the disease or in advanced disease or together with chemotherapy? 
What is your opinion? I, I think it depends a little bit on the type of the tumor, but uh, from a vaccinologist view, the earlier you can target a cancer, the better it is, especially if it is a cancer who trends to metastasis, because then you have to much more targets over the body. So for most of the cancer types, early recognition of a tumor and early immunotherapy would be good. And myself, I would also support a combination therapy from the early beginning, just to be really on the safe side that there's no metastasis around. And uh, what's also very interesting is the oncolytic virus approach, because we can do it parental, so systemic over the whole body, but there's also approaches putting it directly into the, the tumor. And this appears to be really very effective. I've not, not seen data in humans, but I've seen data in horses, which were very promising. And there's a clinical study started Uh, which try to do the same in humans. So we have really, really interesting times. Okay, another question for Gilberto. Let me read it. Could the redirection of the immune response to the chosen antigen be reinforced by boosting the immune response uh, by revaccination? Definitely, yes. We believe that the best strategy would be to reimmunize the patient uh, with the antigen before uh, administering the uh, the vaccine, the nanoparticles loaded with the the, the antigen in the within the tumor, because this could be a, a, a boost for uh, the immune response against the cancer. So the answer is yes. Another question to both of you, and then we close. Uh, have you ever analyzed the immunopeptidome in tumors before and after the treatment with the vaccine? Is uh, any, Have you identified any change, for instance, in the HLA system? Would like to start, Triberto, or...? Uh, I, I never made this kind of uh, of, uh, of analysis. However, there are the study from Soldano Ferrone who demonstrate that the tumor is able to modulate uh, HLA expression uh, in, in, spontaneously because uh, if you get a different uh, site of the tumor, so you can see different. Uh, alleles expressed or even down regulation of HLA expression and indeed after therapy. So um, the immune peptidome uh, is also uh, strictly related with the, the, um, anti, the, the HLA expression. Uh, it's uh, all a, a machinery. And when you stimulate, for instance, with enferon gamma, you see Uh, um, uh, the, the processing of the antigen uh, change and you can have uh, some epitopes, some different epitopes that are bound, are bound to the HLA with respect to the condition of pre-stimulation. So immune peptidomes by sure change with time and change with the, uh, the biology and the development of the tumor. That's why it, it, the focusing on uh, just on tumor antigen is uh, something that uh, um, offer several problems because the tumor can change the 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 game when you when you want. Okay, so I suggest we close. Uh, I think it was a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. In one hour, we have really learned a lot of uh, new opportunities, new frontiers. And as I told you at the beginning, cancer is really a significant scientific challenge that uh, is involving, I presume, thousands of scientists uh, all over the world. Thank you very much, Otfried. Thank you very much, Gilberto. And uh, thank you for all the participants. Let me remind you that we will have already scheduled another uh, webinar at the end of October. 
and we will discuss about the real world evidence studies. As you know, very important new area of studies and the regulators are looking at these studies with great interest. So join us at the end of October for an update on the area of real world evidence study. Grazie Gilberto, vielen Dank hey. Alfred and uh, let's be in contact. Bye yeah, bye. Grazie Domenico. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank ciao. you everybody. Ciao ciao ciao. Thank you.